Good morning. The U.S. Institute of Peace is delighted to welcome you to this critically important conversation about the urgent complex crisis in Mozambique. In the four years since Islamist militants attacked Palma, the port city in Cabo Delgado, thousands of civilians have been killed and close to 700,000 Mozambicans displaced. Without question, the situation in Cabo Delgado presents an urgent humanitarian crisis and threatens the important progress towards peace, prosperity, and democracy that Mozambique has made since the early 1990s. Importantly, the crisis sends another alarming signal that violent extremism impacts significant parts of the African continent. For today's conversation, USIP has gathered representatives from the government of Mozambique and civil society to discuss the conflict and how to address it. We are especially pleased to have with us Mozambique's ambassador to the United States, the Honorable Carlos Dos Santos. Ambassador, thank you for joining us. We encourage everyone to engage with us in ways awareness about the issue on Twitter with hashtag Cabo Delgado Peace. With your permission, Dr. Joseph Sani, the Vice President of USIP's Africa Center will introduce our speakers and facilitate the discussion. Dr. Sani, over to you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for setting the stage for what we anticipate to be a valuable and enriching conversation. As we said, I'm Joseph Sani, Vice President at USIP, and I lead the Africa Center. To help us understand the situation in Northern Mozambique and explore prospects for peace and development, we are pleased to have with us three distinguished panelists. Ambassador Carlos Dos Santos. Ambassador Dos Santos has represented the Republic of Mozambique in the United States since 2015, and most recently served as High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, where he was voted Best African Diplomat of the Year. His long and distinguished career includes serving as ambassador to Germany, director for Europe and the Americas at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, advisor to the president, and permanent representative to the United Nations. Thank you for joining us, Ambassador. Thank you. Ambassador Carlos is joined by Mrs. Chijia Chisungo, activist, founder of Sol National Solidarity Campaign for Cabo Delgado. Chidia is a young Mozambican activist and peace builder, currently pursuing a master's degree in education. Her journey in activism started in 2015, when she founded and led Activista Mozambique Movement. Since then, she has been committed to train, organize, and campaign for human rights in Mozambique. And in 2018, she created a national solidarity campaign for Cabo Delgado province to raise the awareness about the terrorist attack started in 2017. Thank you, Chidia, for joining us. Thank you. Dr. Gregory Pirio is president of Empowering Communication Associates, senior adjunct professorial lecturer at the School of International Service at American University. Dr. Gregory Pirillo is an experienced researcher on political, social, and religious issues. He holds a PhD in African history from UCLA, where his dissertation focused on the political economy of Portuguese colonialism in Mozambique and Angola. He directed the Voice of America's Portuguese to Africa ser service during Mozambique Civil War. He founded and directs Empowering Communication Associates, which is dedicated to empowering organizations, communities, and individuals to make a positive difference in the world and in lives. Thank you, Dr. Gregory Pirillo. Thank you. My for pleasure to be here. This is a great event. Thank you. Now, before we start, let me share some housekeeping information. We recognize that this first USAP event on the issue of Northern Mozambique is only being broadcast in English today. 
We commit to broadcasting future events in Portuguese to ensure we incorporate the viewpoints of our Lusophone colleagues. So I really, we really apologize for that today. We will begin with a moderated panel discussion for about 45 minutes, and then we will open up for Q&A session with you, the audience. Throughout the panel, if members of the audience have questions to pose to the panelists, they may do so in the chat box on the event page or on social media using the hashtag Cabo Delgado Peace. We will address all that we can when we turn to the audience question and answer session. Now, let me turn now to our distinguished panel to explore the question of the day. And I will start with Ambassador Dos Santos. Ambassador, for many years, Mozambique held the promise of a successful post-war country after a protracted civil war that mainly ended in early 90s. Until recently, foreign investments were flowing into the country, so were tourists. Unemployment was in a downward trend. The discovery of natural resources, including liquefied natural gas, carried the promise to transform the country's development. Unfortunately, today, the crisis in Cabo Delgado indicates that something went wrong somewhere. But before we discuss what went wrong, please, Ambassador, help us understand the strategic significance of Cabo Delgado to Mozambique and the region, just to set the stage for what will follow in our conversation. Thank you very much, Sunny. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here. Uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, the Institute of Peace for convening this discussion to raise awareness and to search for solutions to uh, the problem we have uh, at hand. I wanted to thank the president of the Institute, Liz, for joining us, gracing us with a presence which shows her own personal commitment to this issue, her interest in following what goes on. But I wanted also to say that you has the uh, uh, vice president for the, uh, and the uh, head of this uh, Africa Center, you have put this issue on the top priorities of the institution. And we don't take that for granted. We want to express appreciation to you, Sunny, for doing that. Um, the strategic importance uh, of Cabo Delgado, um, to, say, to speak about this, I would start by saying that Cabo Delgado is part of a whole, and the whole is made up of 10 provinces and the capital city of Maputo that constitute the beautiful nation of Mozambique. Now, each province contributes to the diversity of culture of the country, and they do their best to make that contribution. Cabo Delgado does have a special feature in the history of Mozambique in the, uh, because it was where the liberation struggle uh, started to liberate Mozambique from Portuguese colonialism. It, was, uh, it is also uh, the place where the first liberated zones were established. And uh, um, it is also uh, the place where you find some of the best and pristine archipelagos in the world, the Karimbas. So tourism, ecotourism is wonderful there. But what has attracted more attention recently is the endowment in natural resources of Cap Delgado, which includes the best rubies in the world, which includes the world's largest graphite uh, mines or reserves. Uh, but again, what has attracted more attention is the discovery of natural gas, hydrocarbons, offshore 
Cap Delgado that brought oil majors to Mozambique uh, to develop liquefied natural gas. This includes uh, companies from the United States, from Europe, uh, from Asia, and elsewhere. They all flocked there to develop that resource. And I think this is what made Cap Delgado strategically important because it is a game changer in terms of the economy of the country, in terms of the economy of the region and the whole continent of Africa. It's a new global province of natural gas. And I want to state this, it will not go away. It is there and it is there to stay. So the challenge is to make sure that we restore peace as quickly as we can. And this will require a holistic approach to the problem, dealing with uh, uh, the security situation, dealing with the humanitarian situation, and also the socioeconomic uh, development, including um, uh, building resilient communities in that region. And I think this is uh, what should be our focus when we look at Cap Delgado. It's its geostrategic location, it is its endowment in resources that makes it very important, not only for Mozambique, but for the entire region. Thank, thank you, Ambassador, uh, for setting that stage. And I think what I'm hearing is how can we help Cabo Delgado cast away or expel the resource curse? We will get to it. We will get to it. Uh, let me turn to Dr. Pulillo. In one of your numerous articles on Mozambique, uh, you and your co-authors very impressively uh, explain the drivers of violent extremism in Cabo Delgado. Please, can you help us understand how we got here? What has driven violent extremism in Cabo Delgado? Please. Okay, yes, I think this uh, focus on a few uh, drivers of, of the extremist violence there. But um, I th one of the things to underline at the beginning is the issue of the illicit economy that has been uh, taking place in Cabo Delgado for a long time now. And that has been in gems, in wildlife, in drugs uh, uh, passing through there. Um, uh, and why, uh, why is that important? It means that um, illicit trading that is going on uh, has corrupted um, the local officials, um, uh, uh, especially the police. And uh, that puts the, um, the population distrustful of government. Um, and that, so that's a big factor. And, the, um, uh, and I think it's important that the, the violent extremist group up there is to note is that the Mozambican leadership of it uh, that have been identified, uh, some of them have been tr uh, uh, traders, uh, legitimate traders. Um, uh, entrepreneurial types. And um, the stories that we get is that those types of people are often hit up for um, bribes and fines and things like that uh, by the police. So, the, so that, that is one factor to, to bear in mind there. The other one is um, the, uh, the investment that's going on there and the approaches that have been taken. The Ambassador mentioned the Ruby Reserves. Um, there has been considerable uh, hum human rights violations against um, artisanal miners uh, in that region. And um, the killings and tortures uh, uh, by police and this rapid deployment force that are working with uh, uh, the company that uh, holds the concession for the for the ruby mining. This is important, um, and, and in fact, uh, the, uh, the British firm Gemfields is the main uh, producer of these diamonds, and um, they were taken to a court in Britain for these uh, 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 violations of human rights. And there are 263 uh, artisanal miners who were the litigants and was settled outside of court for several million dollars. Um, 
But this is important because the first recruits for violent action uh, in, what is it, 2017 in Mosingwa de Paya were recruited from that area. And that's important because um, I've studied jihadism in many countries in Africa, and one of the drivers is uh, violence, uh, usually by state forces, uh, against um, uh, the population or a peaceful movement. And so they adopt this strategy of, or this narrative of vengeance. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. is going on. Then on the other side, where we had an American firm, Anadarko, began to develop a liquefied natural gas facility uh, along the coast near Palma, the uh, meant resettlement of thousands of Mozambicans. And that didn't go well. Um, I, Anadarko was well-intentioned, um, but uh, uh, the information we get from me and my co-authors, Yusuf Adam and Bob Patali, that we've gotten from uh, local people is that a lot of these youths uh, that were displaced joined uh, the insurgents. And, and, um, and the leaders of the insurgencies came, came from um, uh, Mosingwa de Paya too, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, but anyway, so that was where the first attack was. That's where the leadership uh, came from was Mosingwa de Paya. And then he had youth from a little bit further north joining and that. So um, it, it was a resettlement plan gone awry. And, uh, and that's a big problem um, uh, with not only in Cabo de Gado, but elsewhere in Mozambique. The Catholic Church held uh, um, a meeting in Maputo with people who were uh, representing resettlement schemes throughout the country. And they came up with similar conclusions is that people were, 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 um, were suffering under these conditions and they weren't getting the benefits of all the investment in that there. And so now with the, um, and then you also have in uh, complaints now among the people of Cabo Delgado against the uh, government security forces for their human rights violation. Mm -hmm. And you have, um, which also drives some people into the insurgency. And then of course the insurgents are notorious human rights violators themselves. So people, people are caught within all of this. And um, the, the, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it f there for now, but I think that tries, that gives a, a picture of what has happened. And because of the wealth up there, the population, um, my, my colleague Yusuf Adam has done intensive inter interviews in Cabo Delgado. The population thinks that the whole um, violence up there is all designed to remove them from their land because it's so valuable now. And the resources are so great, yeah. Good. So we so there is uh, we have abuses by security forces, uh, displacement and resettlement gone wrong, and uh, and you have the fact that people have the feeling of being marginalized um, and their life livelihoods taken away. Exactly. Uh, and Chidia, you are on the ground. What do you see, and what do you think? Uh, has been the contribution or not of civil society into this whole situation. Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon and good morning from uh, those who are watching us. I mean, if we go back to the, um, to see the beginning of the conflicts in 2017, we will see that for almost one year, the issue of Cap Delgado was not being addressed properly, even in the country. And we will see that the society in general were silent about this issue. That's why by the end of 2018, um, with other activists, we decided to start a campaign, which is the National Solidarity Campaign, to make sure that people who start 
talking so that the government would feel the pressure and then they would address this in a different way. Because in the beginning, we had, for example, journalists from uh, also international amnesty and even here in Mozambique, journalists who were arrested because they were covering the conflicts in Cabo Garden with like a clear message that nobody would talk about what was going on there. Even to use the term, the term, for example, terrorism, uh, I would say it wasn't allowed. I remember having friends, they were, they are journalists who would say, Sidia, you can talk about this issue, but don't mention like the word terrorism. And what was happening is that who decided or who wanted to talk and use this term terrorist, we are the one who were targeted uh, by people from the government, some of them saying that, oh no, this is something that only the government can talk about, they know what's happening. But when you would turn on your TV, you would listen, like our, um, the, our government saying that, oh no, the situation is under control. But in the other hand, you would receive like messages uh, with pictures, people beheaded on WhatsApp. So there were like a very different way of receiving information. We knew that something wrong was going on. Uh, but we knew as well that we could not talk about it. And the question was, why? That's why even the slogan of, of the campaign was Cap del Gado is also Mozambique, because we wanted people to start thinking. So if there is something happening in Cap del Gado province, um, and there are all these projects that by the end of the day will benefit not only Cap del Gado, but all the country. So why are we all in silence? That's why by the end of 2018, I mean, I would say civil society started to organize in order to not only make the pressure to the government, but also to pr provide assistance to um, the IDPs. In the beginning, only uh, institu religious institutions were providing assistance. The rest of the society, everyone was quiet. And all the noise was to make sure that, uh, okay, the conflicts are happening, but we want to make sure that people's rights are protected. They would have food, they would have um, somewhere to go in, in case um, something goes wrong and attack in the village in the beginning. So by the time, we have seen that civil society has played, I would say, a very important role to make sure that that we decide and we define what is it, the priority in this conflict. Thanks. Uh, I will give the ambassador the chance to clarify or to respond or uh, to what we have heard so far. Ambassador, please, do you have something to add or just to clarify? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and I, I thank uh, uh, my co-panelists for, for their observations. What I would say is, uh, there are uh, different ways of looking at the problem in the country. And we have uh, had this too. Uh, and I would uh, uh, say first, Mozambique is a democracy and um, the country is uh, 46 years young and the country is building uh, democratic institutions and democratic practices. Uh, Mozambique has uh, one of the most vibrant press uh, that you can get, uh, public and private. You have a civil society that has grown fast and has been uh, able to do what they are doing now because there is a democracy in the country. Um, and living in, uh, in the United States and working in the United States, I'm inspired by the constant search for a more perfect union. And this is what I think Mozambique is yearning for. Mozambique is trying to build a more perfect nation. And I think the challenges that we have uh, uh, will continue to be there as they are in many other countries. And uh, we speak of human rights violations, but yes, the government is not promoting human rights violations. The government is protecting the fundamental freedoms of the country, and it has done so uh, in such a way that it has uh, enlisted the support uh, of partners from the United States uh, as a country, uh, the European Union, uh, all important partners that work with Mozambique have supported the government to constantly improve the political, economic, 
and corporate governance in the country. Now, going back to the issue of uh, Anadarko, for instance, I think it would be wrong to uh, think that uh, the emergence of this conflict is because of the investment of Anadarko, which was uh, wrongly done. I don't think so. And I followed from uh, the start of the, the whole process. Um, what happened was there was a very vivid discussion which was uh, initiated by civil society on how resettlement was being done. And I remember members of parliament visited the resettlement areas, corrected the designs of the houses that were going to be given to the people uh, who were being resettled from the areas where the project was going to be developed. And those improvements were made. And you have beautiful houses for the people because those corrections were made. And there, was also, there were also issues of compensation, compensations, the issues of respecting uh, the ancestral lands of the people. When you compensate, it's not just giving money, it's making sure that you respect the ancestral land and you do the traditional work that needs to be done. All of those things were done and uh, the whole project has provided employment, not to all young people, but it has provided employment. And the promise of that investment, bringing good to the people in Cabo Delgado and the whole nation is still there and is appreciated by many. And I Master, think- let, 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 let me press you a little bit. Uh, yeah. So uh, we know there is an insurgency in Cabo Delgado. We know- uh, tragic things. The situation is really tragic. So are there any lessons the government should learn from this insurgency? Mistakes not to be repeated. Are there anything you are learning from that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, the, first thing, the first thing is to act promptly. Uh, 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 as CJ was saying, uh, probably action was not as prompt as it should have been at the very beginning. And it was thought that this was a minor problem. And then the escalation started to happen. And when you have the kinds of tactics that terrorists use, you are not always aware, even if you are government, you are not always aware of how they will act and what they will do. And I think a uh, prompt, swift action should have helped. And also- uh, Ambassador, it, allow, allow it, me, allow me. When yeah. you say prompt, swift action, is it military? What type of action is it? You know, is it actually, it? when you interrupted me, I, I was going to say, engage local communities in trying to understand what is going on. And also intelligence gathering, and also uh, have multidisciplinary studies and analysis by competent experts, listening to uh, other countries that have gone through the same problem, other regions that have gone through the same, same problem, like the Sahel, the Nigeria uh, with Boko Haram and others, uh, studying those and working on building a resilient community, a more attentive community that will work with government institutions to ensure protection for them, but also prevention measures, and also uh, try to address any root causes, if any. When you're dealing with terrorists, you, you, you don't identify uh, serious root causes that you would say are from within. Now, they take advantage of some of the imperfections of uh, that they find in the country. And th I think that's what the professor and CEO was were talking about. It was about some of the imperfections, some of the corruption. Uh, there's no country that doesn't have corruption, but that, that doesn't mean that government forces all of them. And uh, the government as a whole is pursuing a line of illicit trade, a line of drug trafficking, a line of corruption. I think that perception should be uh, corrected. Dr. Pirio, 
do you think there is something missing in this narrative about Cabo Delgado? What are we missing? Based on your well, work? Let me just say to the ambassador that um, my heart goes out to the Mozambican people because of all the suffering that is taking place there. And I remember my first visit to Mozambique in 1983. I was in Maputo, and I we were Maputo was experiencing something similar because of the civil war, lack of food, et cetera. It was horrific. And I'm, I'm so sorry that uh, parts of Mozambique are going through the, 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 something similar today. And that, and that, and I think that I want to lead you say that to lead me into this thing is that I think in our analysis of what's going on, that we need to look at the kind of narrative that we have for the situation up there. And this is from a strategic communication point of view. I think that we really ought to be looking at uh, both the US government and the Mozambican government, I'm not a Mozambican, but I'll make a suggestion, is that um, the narrative be about how do we end the suffering of the people there, uh, that, and a less emphasis uh, in this narrative on ISIS, that is the US government uh, has put out recently. Not that that's not important, but uh, we there, we need to win the hearts and minds of the, the people uh, of Cabo Delgado right now. And I think um, uh, shifting the narrative to their suffering and the alleviation of it is is really important. Thank you. Uh, so yeah. I, I want, and, and there are a lot of other things that, that go along with that, uh, but that's important. And, and, and I think when, people speak of the situation, we have to speak from a position of empathy and caring. Because in right now in Cabo Delgado, there's a lot of distrust in government. And that's something that um, if we're going to get beyond this, we have to create this. And I think the ambassador hit it on is engagement with the communities. Is There has to be a participatory approach for all the development that's going to be taking place. and um, and in the counterterrorism that's taking place, there, there, it, it has to be participatory. Um, and uh, so I really think that that's, and if I can add one more thing here is that um, after we learned that youth who had been resettled by Anadarko had been joining the insurgency, um, we, um, uh, my co-authors and I, we produce, we we talked to Anna Darko and we said, look at, uh, you need to have dialogue, greater dialogue with the community, find out what's going on and all that. Their reaction at the time at the time was, well, that's expensive. That's uh, uh, maybe we can do that down the line with U.S. aid. And, and 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 so on the basis of that, we wrote an article. It was published in the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Um, about what would be a good methodology for uh, um, uh, engaging communities when you have investments of this type. Let, let me, let me, you are, you are asking a good question that Shidia can help, uh, can help, can answer. Shidia, you work with communities, you work with civil society. What does that mean, engaging with community? What have you seen in the ground? Is it happening? or how should it happen? Okay, thanks once again. I mean, um, I, I was attentively listening to what Gregor uh, was saying, and it's definitely important to include community if uh, what we are doing involves the community somehow. And in Cap Delgado particularly, it's important that people feel that their lives matter. It's not only about um, the projects, it's about um, making sure that whatever is going on there will contribute to the future of the country. Someone needs to have this conversation with people because at this time, everyone thinks that these projects are coming to take them uh, their lives, to take them their freedom, et cetera. So 
it's extremely important even to promote uh, these conversations around the community. If you are asking me if this is happening, I would say it's happening, but maybe we should improve the way we are doing things because by the end of the day, the conceptions and the narrative that the community have, it's not good. It's not good. And it, uh, I would say it opens um, the vulnerability for all this situation to take place. If people have misconceptions, probably by the end of the day, they can take um, uh, wrong decisions just because of the information that they receive. That's why even the, in the beginning of all this complex, we have been seeing that the strategy of communication, not only for, from uh, these uh, big organizations, but even from the government, need to be very clear and very direct so that everyone will have uh, information from trustable sources and the, in the right way. So definitely, the communication here uh, needs to improve, especially with people in the community. It needs to be better. Thanks, Chidi. And Ambassador, those are clearly uh, wise advice. <laughs> advice. And please, can you explain to us the government strategies, not just the communication, but overall, uh, and some of the priorities? Yes, indeed. Uh, the government of Mozambique uh, is uh, very conscious of the fact that the primary responsibility to protect uh, the people of the country rests on the government of Mozambique. And uh, it also rests on all institutions of the country and political actors and civil society organizations are conscious of that. They hold the primary responsibility. And the government uh, uh, has uh, uh, taken the decision that the solution of the problem is not only security and military. That is one important factor which has to be dealt with immediately. And that is happening. But the uh, second thing is humanitarian assistance to the internally displaced people that uh, the president of the Institute spoke about when uh, she was making the initial remarks. It's a large number of people who are left without anything. That has to be well coordinated and making sure that all those wanting to assist will be able to assist and the government is coordinating that effort. But then you have the social, economic and cultural problem, uh, issues that need to be addressed from the medium to long term. And for that purpose, the government created an agency, uh, the uh, Agency for the Integrated Development of the North, ADIM. This agency aims at looking at the whole of the northern region of the country, including Cap Delgado. The headquarters of ADIM will be, uh, is actually in uh, Pemba, the capital city of Cap Delgado. And the idea is that this agency will uh, mobilize support, will get the resources of the government, and will assist in developing holistic programs that will look at cultural issues, short social issues, resilient communities, and things like that. And now that they are developing the strategic plan uh, for this agency, they have gone to the three provinces and held consultations as they built that strategy. And the strategy aims at doing, uh, at doing just that. Now, there are uh, governments, uh, international uh, partners, and uh, international agencies that are helping. And I want to highlight here USID, the United States government, uh, through the embassy and USID. Uh, you have the European Union helping, the uh, African Development Bank helping, but most importantly, on the institutional framework and even providing resources to launch this agency is the World Bank. The World Bank has put up uh, serious resources and technical assistance to make this uh, a workable and effective institution. Thanks. Yes, uh, we just we learned that last month the World Bank signed a 100 million grant uh, to support the Northern Integrated Development Agency you just mentioned, ADIN. Um, and uh, 
the World Bank has also made uh, Mozambique eligible for the Prevention and Resilience Allocation Fund, so opening the door for another $700 million. So more resources have been poor, but um, Dr. DePiglio, is it a sign that the government of Mozambique and its international partners are shifting strategy from a security-only response to a more comprehensive one? Um, of course, there must be security for development to follow, but are there reasons to be hopeful or you still see some risk and pitfalls? Well, I, I, what I think um, what we have to look at right now is, again, uh, restoring the trust. The, it has been damaged, the population, they, the population feels that um, it is being forced off its land by the violence because they're it's so wealthy and they, they want to they want to return home they want to uh, uh, to their ancestral homes they want to uh, engage in their livelihood activities again the IDPs um, so I think yeah all, all of this is great um, and important. But let's again, I, I can't overemphasize the participatory approach. This means getting at, at, the, at the village level, uh, talking with uh, the leaders, the uh, traditional religious, um, um, the youth, the women's groups, and, and hearing so that they can, they can plan out the steps that need to be taken to improve their lives. And, and 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 that that's so important. M development money in itself uh, doesn't guarantee that, and 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 that's it. That's that's important. And I'm sure I'm sure that that's what people want. It, but it needs to be done. But given yeah, given the security situation on the town, is it possible to have those participatory processes? What what's your feeling being in the ground there? Can you please repeat the question, please? Yeah, given the security situation now in Cabo Delgado, is it possible to really engage communities? I mean, the thing is that we have no option. We need to engage communities. It's not something that it's optional, that we have to choose or not. It needs to happen. And um, the priority now is to define how we'll do that. And I'm really glad um, uh, that our ambassador is here because it's very important that whatever we are defining has a strategy to address this issue in uh, all the dimensions because like uh, military force is just one, but there is the others that contribute by the end of the day. We need to make sure that there is transparency in the way that um, all these, for example, supports that we will be receiving will be managed so that people will understand as well that nobody's taking advantage of their suffering during this time, that uh, the priority is definitely the people Nobody will take any, but any um, uh, advantage. And we will make sure definitely that the development will be integrated and not, and not something that will be only for this certain type of people and then the other ones will feel excluded because this is what we have to try to avoid now, that everyone feels that they are part of the same uh, country. There are no more or less Mozambicans that everyone really uh, are really important for this process. So the answer is we do, we need to do that and no, no options, but the way we will do that is the, the key the important thing for us to discuss now. Yeah, and uh, we go back to Ambassador, just uh, on the issue of security moving, because we will need the security uh, approach or strategy to combine with what uh, uh, Dr. Pirio uh, said and Chidia in terms of building trust. Um, but what's your assessment? What, what's, is there a new shift in the security approach from the government perspective? What's the vision of security and the strategy the government is planning to put uh, in place? Yes, uh, the government uh, is, is acting on the basis of the means and resources that it has. And, uh, um, and I think there is some degree of success because if it were not, 
then you we would uh, have an escalation and a spread of this conflict beyond the region that is affected now. So there is some degree of success, but uh, the, the government is also conscious of the fact that it needs to do more uh, and it needs more resources, it needs more training. Uh, and uh, the, the terrorism factor is a new thing in Mozambique. We have had conflicts before and we have known who is on this side or the other side, but these are terrorist attacks. So you have to develop strategies that uh, can fight this kind of uh, terrorism. Now, the government has, is doing what it can, but it's also eliciting support and it, has, it is getting support for training, boosting the capacity of the security, defense, and police forces of the country. It is also uh, hoping to get equipment, financial resources to make that operational. Now, you have the region of Sadak that has arrangements within the region uh, for defense of each member state whenever there's a conflict. And you have followed the meetings that have already happened and an assessment, a needs assessment mission has been there and has uh, done its, uh, its work. We have work uh, uh, going on with the European Union, uh, the United States has sent uh, people to train, and these are the things that need to be done. Uh, I cannot be more specific about military and security issues. I would leave that to the experts, to the generals, uh, but I think this is what is uh, happening. People ask uh, whether Mozambique needs boots on the ground from uh, foreign militaries. I was getting at that. <laughs> it's a good question, but it is about the capacity to deal with the issue. Is it through additional uh, people from outside or by training? The government has opted initially at this stage uh, in terms of training and boosting the capacity of the local forces. If there is a point where there is need for more. We have had a peacekeeping uh, operation of the United Nations in Mozambique. So this is not something new uh, for Mozambique in terms of having people from outside come and assist. Uh, and uh, it was one of the most successful peacekeeping operations uh, uh, around the world, the one that was in Mozambique. So it's not the issue. Thanks. Uh, before we get to the audience, I will just remind people, please post your questions on the website or uh, hashtag Cabo Delgado, please. Um, but before, I have another question. Uh, Studia is for you. Mozambique is a big country trying to strengthen its democratic practices, and the ambassador said it was. Uh, the national elections were held in 2019. The opposition political party, Renamo, has criticized the government over Cabo Delgado. So, Shidia, how do Mozambique domestic politics impact Cabo Delgado and vice versa? In how many minutes? <laughs> In one minute, <laughs> if you can. Okay. Okay, so I think we cannot look at things just with one perspective. We need to read all the picture and understand how the politics in general works in Mozambique so that we will understand even the situation that Cap Delgado is um, today. So we will find like a very challenging scenario in Mozambique in terms of um, not only um, political participation in the perspective of the political parties, but also in the, the society in general. And we will find that it's a little bit complicated uh, because of, um, of the background that we have in terms of uh, democracy. The, the ambassador was saying that we are very young. Yes, I say yes, but we have good examples around the world and uh, we can learn from them the same way we learn about other, other, other topics. In terms of the situation and the positions that we have in Cap Delgado today, I would say that this is um, about the way things have been um, 
uh, how do I say it in, in English? Like manage it. Is that the correct word? Maybe Money. I would say that. Money. That uh, we have three regions in Mozambique, the south, the center, and the north. But when we see in terms of how people understand the development of the country, they will always say that the center and the north, they are all always being excluded from more um, opportunities. And that maybe can explain the reason why we have also young people really engaged in, um, in being parts uh, of the terrorist groups. Most of them, I mean, some of them, according to the results of the studies that have been made, it's because of lack of, um, uh, of employment, but also ex exclusion in general. So these can help us understand a little bit how things are. And if you ask me, why we we uh, we we are in the stage that we are? I wouldn't properly give you an answer because even uh, when we see the structure of the government, we will find many people coming from the center, from the north of the country. But what about in terms of uh, making something for these regions? Then is where the the question comes. It looks like all of the attentions until now were to the south, and probably. Uh, things are changing because of the resources that were discovered like in the north of the country. So all the changes I like, I kind of shifting for, from that side, but that's not the best way to, I mean, to lead uh, a nation to uh, development because we need to make sure that development is integrated so that people won't feel excluded. And we will find definitely groups in the center and the north. I mean, even if it's like political related, they will always uh, be I would say sometimes um, against most of the things, not because uh, they they don't have ideas, but because they feel excluded in the process of contributing somehow to uh, what should be the priorities um, in the country. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Pirillo, anything to add from a historical perspective or? Well, let me just add, I think a couple things. I. This, tr this training that the Mozambican military is getting, uh, has gotten from the U.S., it's small scale, and they're getting from Portugal, I think the EU, I think is really important. Uh, and there, there's important lessons to be learned from other countries, as, as the ambassador has said. I think there also needs to be on um, place a well thought out and effective strategy to promote defections from the Mashababos, the the, the the, 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 those young people who have joined in, in this insurgency, and and the re, in, in reintegration, and I'm yeah. I'm looking at Uganda, what was done with the Lord's Resistance Army, which could give some real good indications about how that can be done. And I believe the U.S. military was involved in supporting that that project there. Uh, but and there have been some good studies done on that, lessons learned. The other thing is there was a good a real interesting interview with the judge in Cabo Delgado, who tries the people who are brought in and accused of being part of the, the, the insurgent group. And he mm -hmm. says, well, I have to let 95% of them go because there's no evidence. Um, and and very interestingly, he said, I, I think we could learn from other countries, how other countries have handled this because my training in the in the legal system, however good it is, is not sufficient for what we're we're dealing with here. And so I think, and, and so those kinds of, and that could fit into a nice defection reintegr uh, reintegration kind of program, which will be, and how do we attract these young people away from the group and keep them out, uh, and, and rather than just thinking about killing them. You know, yes. you know how, how how can we accomplish this? Because a lot of them have been misled to go there and uh, out of frustration and unemployment. The other thing the judge said was that uh, ninety five percent of the young men who come before him are illiterate, which says something about the education system and the lack of opportunities that they would have because of that. Yes. Uh, I think. Mozambique will have a lot, uh, will benefit a lot from learning from neighboring countries, I think. Uh, and then I think about Santo, you will agree with that. And that's something you also mentioned, that uh, maybe one of the lessons learned is to learn from others. 
Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, th th that is correct. And uh, 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 the professor did mention the uh, the experience of uh, uh, Uganda. I, I should mention that uh, President Chisan was one of the envoys to work. Uh, president Chisan is a former president of Mozambique, and he worked uh, after uh, after leaving office. He worked on that particular conflict, uh, so he does have experience on it. Uh, and I'm sure he's sharing internally, but we are trying to learn uh, from uh, different partners. And uh, yes, uh, uh, inc inclusion and a sense of all citizens being included and all regions of the country being included in development. Yes, that is something that the government has been pursuing uh, uh, for for the many years and integrated development of the whole country. And I think uh, th there are strides being made there. I will turn now to questions from the audience. And then there is one, there are a couple of questions. I will pick one uh, around re religion. And what is the role of religion in the conflict dynamics? And are there roles for religious actors in peace efforts in Cabo Delgado? Uh, Ambassador Tirio or Chidia, please. Uh, yes, I can start. Please. Yes. Uh, Mozambique is a secular state. Uh, during colonialism, uh, the Catholic religion was the most important one, and that did create a division among religions. But after independence, uh, Mozambique became a secular state, and it allowed uh, the development, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, development of religions and freedom of, of religion. And because of the past, there were some tensions between the state uh, and uh, the Catholic Church, but uh, those uh, issues were resolved such that uh, today uh, we, we have uh, um, uh, diplomatic relations with the Vatican. And uh, 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 I was privileged to be the first ambassador of Mozambique to the Vatican when I was in Germany. Uh, so uh, the Catholic religion is still important. And then you have uh, the Muslim uh, group, which is large, uh, and other Christian religions, and then traditional religions. Now, uh, the churches have always been involved in the peace processes in the country previously. Uh, when we had the, the uh, for for the country to reach the negotiation process in Rome uh, between the government and Renamo, there was a lot of uh, groundwork that was done with the involvement of the churches. The churches uh, did uh, speak to both sides of the pond that didn't want to speak to each other. And that helped. Uh, now, uh, with regard to Cabo Delgado, there have been uh, insinuations or accusations that uh, the Muslims are the ones driving this. And it is definitely clear uh, to me and to many Mozambicans, uh, to most Mozambicans, that the Muslim religion in the country is actually a good religion, like others who are promoting peace in the country. And they have done a lot. Now, that there may be elements from there who will be involved with extremists, of course, but that doesn't make it uh, uh, um, a promoter of terrorism. And uh, I think the role that they can play is precisely to assist and to be involved in the search for solutions to the problem. But they are not the problem. Lydia, yeah. uh, how do you, how can we engage better in gay religious leaders, whether Muslims or Christians? How, from your own experience? Okay, um, if you remember in the beginning, I was saying that before 2019, most of the assistance that were being given to the displaced people were being given by the religious institutions. I mean Christians and I mean uh, Muslims. Since the beginning, the religious institutions have helped like 
so much uh, to make sure that uh, um, all the country will be paying attention to this issue. Even until now, we have, for example, uh, the Catholic Church always writing open letters to the to the president uh, to make sure that he knows what are the uh, what are their point of views and what should be the the priorities in according to what they think should be. And in other hand, we also have the Muslim um, uh, religious institutions here, making sure that within their community, they spread the message that this is not what um, uh, should be. If some of them are following this, it's because they believe in something different from what uh, should be. We have them uh, clearly distancing themselves from, from that and making sure that people from the community we won't be like confused about what sh should they follow or not. So I would say that they play a great role here in the country to make sure that they bring more people in the message of uh, peace and not uh, violence. Uh, I, yes, good. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to add something here. Um, the, what's going on there is not about Islam. It's about vengeance. It's not, you know, and people are hijacking uh, uh, religious terminology to carry out uh, uh, what is essentially a narrative of vengeance. And the other thing is, is uh, Mozambique doesn't have religious conflict. I remember this was several years ago. I was in Beira, which is further south, but I was at the Islamic Center there. I was working on a, um, a program. This was the interreligious program. Uh, to fight to to end malaria, um, and uh, we were sitting around, and I asked the question. There were Christians and Muslim uh, leaders around the table, and I asked them this question. I said, "Why is it that in Mozambique you can get along so well when in other countries are divided by religion?" And they teared up, <laughs> and and they said. It's because our political leaders have never divided us on the basis of religion. And, and, and so I think when we're thinking of Mozambique, this is not a religious conflict. And some of the great defenders of what's going on and the abuses against um, uh, Muslims had been the Catholic Church, for instance, uh, yeah. Pemba, yeah. and, and the call for social uh, justice. So yeah, let's, let's not look at this as a religious conflict. Thanks. Uh, I have another question for Ambassador Santos. Uh, why is the resistance for security sector support from the Southern African Development Community, from the SADC? We have seen that the president has been a little bit reluctant to allow uh, military support from neighboring countries. Is there a reason? No, I think there's a misperception there because uh, Mozambique is uh, a SADC member state uh, from the very beginning, and uh, it is now chairing SADC. And the president has uh, had several meetings with the chairman of the organ, the president of Botswana, and uh, the other presidents that uh, uh, have been working with him uh, from within the region. And uh, you had the needs assessment mission which uh, uh, was in Mozambique and produced a report. And uh, that report was uh, uh, a SADC report, which means Mozambique was included. And then you had a ministerial meeting that uh, included Mozambique and Mozambique uh, didn't chair that meeting because it was chaired by the organ, uh, but it was there, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs was there. So I think it is a misperception that uh, uh, the president is reluctant to accept the help of his colleagues in, uh, in Southern Africa, the countries of the region. Those are his most trusted allies, uh, I would say, uh, taking uh, the basis of history. And uh, there has been so much support uh, in the past from Tanzania, from Zimbabwe, from uh, South Africa and others. Why should Mozambique accept now? Uh, I think what is uh, going on now is to make sure that the government receives the support that it can lead, it can coordinate, it can manage. And 
just another question in terms of what concretely the international community, uh, what can they do to support um, the government or uh, in Cabo Delgado? What, con what do you expect concretely from let's, the development uh, community? What, what do you expect? Uh, on the development side, I think it's uh, uh, one uh, humanitarian assistance, which can be in financial resources, in, uh, in, in material resources and using different mechanisms through the UN, uh, through non-governmental organizations uh, and other mechanisms. And also working with government, government institutions that are working uh, on the ground. That's humanitarian. On the development side, it would be good to support ADIM uh, technically, but also in terms of financial resources and technical capacity and uh, make it work because it is all inclusive. It is about the integration uh, of all plans, programs for the development of the North, not just Cabo Delgado, but uh, the Northern part uh, of the country. And I'm glad to say that countries like the United States, uh, where I'm working now, Canada, that I'm also covering from here, uh, the European Union, uh, the uh, uh, institutions like the World Bank, the, uh, the IMF, uh, and uh, the African Development Bank, all these institutions are supporting the government uh, in these strategies. Yes, uh, so I keep, we keep receiving questions. Uh, I have another one. Uh, we can't ignore the fact that there is corruption. Uh, we can ignore the fact that um, there are human rights abuses. Um, so what is the government doing to address those domestic issues yes, that yes. may be an impediment? And this is a question I will start with Sidia, uh, just to, if it's possible, is it true? Um, and what do you think the government can do to address these domestic obstacles to improve the management of foreign assistance or the management of development? Uh, assistance to Cabo Delgado first, and then the ambassador, you will, you will, you will respond. Yes, as I said in the beginning, it's extremely important to build the trust, especially for those who have the will to support. And people know our background as a country, that it's not that beautiful. So it's important for us to make sure that at least for this time, not only for this time, but I mean in general, but this is a very specific thing. So I would say that um, since we already know that there are many organizations, there are many countries who will be supporting us, it's important to build uh, the capacity for those who will be able to manage. Even now, the situation in Cap Del Garden in terms of humanitarian support, there are many organizations, I would say, uh, that are trying to do something, but the coordination uh, of these organizations, it's not happening in the proper way. And also some of the people, even including local, as a young person, because I have contact with young people, I know that most of them have no experience, of course, and it's important at this point, if we prepare people to deal with this situation. And it's not only the, uh, the, the people in the communities that needs to be prepared, even the people from the government who will be in the front line to manage this, they need to make sure uh, that they are representing the holy country and the humanitarian support is but very, very important that it's properly managed because if we properly address this in the, uh, on the ground, we make sure that we reduce the vulnerability of the people. The more people feel uh, the poverty, the more, the more the most people feel abundant, there is space even for them to be easily engaged with uh, the terrorists. So it's important for us not only to see from only what we receive, but to see the importance of what we are receiving and what will be the impact of the people um, on the ground. And it's important as well that the government opens space, even for the civil society, to be able to not only to audit, to see how things have been managed, to be able to support in terms of uh, what should be done to be improved. This is a very um, uh, complicated situation. We want to make sure that people keep supporting us. And for that, 
that we need to make sure that we are we are transparent in the way that we manage uh, all the support that we are receiving. I have a question for uh, Greg, but uh, Ambassador, do you want to respond? And then I will quickly, and then I have a question for Greg on negotiating yeah. with the Hadith. Just, just very briefly to, to, to totally agree with Cydia what she has said. Uh, let's build the capacities of those intervening within the country to be able to do so. Uh, and with regard to corruption, if you uh, know Africa well, you will know that Mozambique is one of the countries that has the most government ministers going to prison, the most uh, very important uh, heads of uh, uh, public enterprises going to prison and, uh, uh, and being charged seriously. And uh, I don't think uh, we, we can say that uh, the government is uh, not fighting corruption. We have an office uh, dedicated to that. It, it was initially an office within the Attorney General's office, but now it's an, in, uh, uh, an office of its own that has done a great deal. Is it enough? No, because corruption continues to grow, like it is growing everywhere. And where there is corruption, there is corrupt all. Those who come from within, from without, and they corrupt the people there. So it is a serious problem that we have to take um, uh, into our own hands internationally, locally, but also internationally, and make sure that we fight, uh, we fight it. Mozambique has learned the, um, has learned the hard way because when we had these so-called hidden debts, I would call them undeclared debts to the IMF, uh, the country suffered a lot. And this is being de dealt with. And even legislation is being improved. Uh, is, institutions are, be are being improved to make sure that something like that, of that magnitude, never happens again. And the I fight of corruption has to involve everyone. I agree. Uh uh, I, I apologize in advance because we will not cover all the questions. There are many questions. I have a last last question for Greg. Uh, the question is about negotiating with jihadists. Greg, do you think the government can negotiate with Al Shabaab or should negotiate with Al Shabaab? My goodness, that's a big question. Um, in Thirty seconds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I think what. I think that they should be open to 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 that because we want to uh, come out with a peaceful solution. How we get to that point where you can negotiate with people that um, you really don't even know uh, and unclear of the leadership and and that sort of thing is. But you know, I wish I had a good answer for you on this, but I. I I, th I think I think it would be um, uh, important to get to that stage of where you can begin to create some trust. Yeah. Um, I I remember when um, for how long the Mozambican government never uh, uh, negotiated with Renamo. It was uh, under South African control for so long, and when when it got out of that, it, that opened the page. And who whoever thought that it was possible to to uh, for that to happen, that there would be uh, peace talks and everything going on. So, and remember, they were considered armed bandits back then uh, by Ferlimo, um, but it got to that point. So, how we get to that point, I'm not completely clear. In the meantime, I think that narrative of concern about uh, the Mozambican, uh, the Mozambicans who are caught up in this, that this is why why we want peace is, is to help the population, that it's not just an internationalist agenda, et cetera, et cetera, will begin to open the space where uh, people can uh, think, okay, uh, let's work towards that end and maybe pull support away from, from the, the jihadists. But I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Ambassador, you have the final word uh, from the panelists in 30 seconds, if possible. Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, what I would say is that uh, um, 
the one point that we have to carry from this discussion, and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity, is the sense of urgency in all we do, because it's just too many people suffering. So whatever we can do and do it together, we should do it. And Cabo Delgado uh, still has the promise of changing uh, the economy of the country, of changing the living conditions of the people in Cabo Delgado, in Mozambique, and throughout Southern Africa and beyond. So let's work on making sure that we keep Cabo Delgado as a promise to uh, change this game. Thank you. This has been a good and frank dialogue. Uh, uh, as we have heard, uh, Cabo Delgado is more than violent extremism or a major natural gas development. Uh, these are the issues that have received the most international attention. Northern Mozambique is a complex challenge, as we have learned, economic, political, and social, one that must be met for the sake of the suffering Mozambican people. Not too long ago, Mozambique was war shattered. The international community engaged in that complex situations and peace was built. A peace that had been maintained since 1990s. Now, we have to bring that same intense engagement and sense of urgency to Cabo Delgado and realize the promise of the inclusive peace that the Mozambican people deserve. Ambassador Dos Santos, Dr. Pirillo, and Ms. Chisungo, thank you for sharing your expertise with us today and improving our understanding for, of the crisis. Uh, to all of you attending, thank you for being part of the conversation. We look forward to having you again, uh, again soon. To learn more about USIP work in Africa and future events, please visit our website, www.usip.org. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much.